All right, so hello everyone. Thank you for uh, troubleshooting with us this Sunday. Uh, Kelly Taylor Mitchell, born 1994, is an artist and educator who lives and works in Atlanta, Georgia, where she is currently an artist in resident with the Studio Artist Program at Atlanta Contemporary. Kelly is an assistant professor of art and visual culture and the art program director at Spelman College. Kelly's multidisciplinary practice centers oral history and ancestral memory woven into the fabric of the African diaspora in order to present speculative futures specifically related to the concepts of community autonomy, swamp marinage, and inherited identity. Utilizing printmaking, papermaking, sculpture, and textiles, her work manifests as immersive installations, performative objects, and partnered artist books offering a venue for the sensorial, specifically smell, to connect to, convey, and reimagine rituals and rites of autonomous kin, collectives, and individuals of the African diaspora. Kelly has participated in residences at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, Anderson Ranch Art Center, and is an upcoming resident at the Women's Studio Workshop. She holds an MFA in printmaking from the Rhode Island School of Design, and a BFA in printmaking from Tufts University and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Just asking um, for all of us just to take a, a minute and acknowledge the sort of gravity of this moment and this situation, and especially for the non-Black folks joining us. I'm just asking you to make sure every day you're asking yourself, what are you doing um, to be anti-racist today? Um, and what are you doing to advocate for the lives of Black people? Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, and if you're wondering about different ways you can do that, um, you can get involved in your community, um, Google different organizations, you can um, donate. These are some um, legitimate organizations that you can donate to if you're able. Um, and of course, um, you can reach out to people in your life, you can get out in the street, um, and you can use your voice. So I just, I just ask that you uh, do that. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, my other suggestion, thinking about this moment and sort of moving into my studio practice, um, is to read, is to really actively um, be committed to educating yourself. Um, these are some books that I recommend, um, and they're books that have served me in my studio practice. Um, first and foremost, In the Wake, um, on Blackness and Being by Christina Sharp. Um, I was introduced to this book in grad school, um, and it really... Um, was huge for me. It was a major, a major moment, and I shared this book with my students um, last semester, and they created work and response. So I really encourage you to engage. If, if, if any of these texts speak to you, I hope it's that one. Um, also, I recommend Merchant Strategy. It's a great book for as a resource. You can sort of jump around, start anywhere. And then I'm currently reading Race After Technology, um, which is really sort of subverting this idea that we live in a post-racial world with the introduction of technology. Uh, next slide. Yep. So I had hoped that I would see you guys today and that we would be sharing space in studio. Um, and I'm sewing right now. I'm working on a mask. I'm sitting at the table that you're looking at in this image. Um, so I'm sorry that we cannot be doing that um, together, even though I'm glad that we are on this phone call. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'm going to be just really discussing the mask that I'm currently making in my practice right now. Um, there's a lot of work in my studio, and for the sake of time, we're, of course, not going to talk about everything, so I encourage you, if the work speaks to you in any way, um, go to my website, kellytaylormitchellstudio.com, um, or go to Instagram, kellytaylormitchellstudio, and you can sort of stay up to date there. Um, but I started making these, um, what I call protective masks, um, in winter of 2019, when I was an artist residence at Anderson Ranch Art Center, um, and the work is directly in response to um, this discovery I had with my family history when I was in grad school. I was introduced to our history with the Great Dismal Swamp, um, which is the largest um, uh, formerly maroon colony um, in the United States. So formerly enslaved people gathered, created community, economy, et cetera, um, in this space. And this happens um, around the globe. And I learned about my family's relationship uh, to this space. My All of my thesis work in grad school was about that discovery, that seeking, that journey. Um, and then I started to have this desire to find these autonomous communities elsewhere, um, find links, find patterns. And I really started to identify themes of performance, uh, themes of embodiment, and themes of ritual in these different autonomous Black spaces. Um, so I started making these maps very much informed by the practice of Egon Gun um, style maps um, from the Yoruba tradition. Um, and all across sort of African religious traditions, we see people covering their face. 
um, as a way to either embody Orishas or deities or to connect with some sort of ancestral force. Um, next slide. Um, and I wear these masks in... Um, in partnership with these performative textile objects. So you're seeing one here. I'm not gonna show you all of them today. I just um, included a handful. Um, but these um, performative textile objects are very much informed by the practice of Afro-Brazilian mandingas, um, wherein an adherent would wear a leather satchel around their neck and the satchel would hold items um, that would either, you know, draw in good or protect them from harm. Um, and oftentimes those objects would be the same thing. So I was really drawn to this idea of really being in control of um, protecting yourself and garnering good for yourself. Um, and so these two tools work together um, as a force for me to try to connect to these oral histories, to this ancestral memory, um, as I'm trying to learn more um, and construct my own identity. Next slide. So again, another mask, and you can see here, they're really labor intensive, and I, I really um, love and um, value the sort of slowness that my work offers me. I tend to be a super rushed um, maker. I love to work quickly, um, and I think that's why I was drawn to printmaking. I went to school for printmaking, and I think I loved how much it required me to slow down, to think about process, um, to think about the impact of taking things apart and putting them back together. Um, and so I see that um, happening in these masks. Um, and I also think the work is so private. There's such um, an intense level of intimacy. And I think so much of that comes from the time spent, um, the labor spent in the making. Next slide. Um, so we have another uh, performative textile object. Objects, excuse me. And just to clarify, I really see these as art objects um, unless they are being utilized in private performance. And that's when I see both the textile objects and the masks. Um, as utilitarian. Um, so again, you have um, references to these communities, just like you did on the other um, textile object. You saw popcorn there. Here you see um, black eyed peas. You see more of these ceramic beads um, and hand sewing. Um, and you also see in the background um, is another um, performative um, textile object. Um, oftentimes when I'm making these masks, I'm working really intuitively, so I'm not necessarily referring to something. This mask is an exception. Um, uh, a few summers ago, two summers, I believe now, it's hard to believe it feels like it was yesterday. Um, I was able to visit Bahia, Brazil, um, and engage and encounter and create kinship with some of these autonomous communities that I'm describing. Um, and that um, flower motif that you see in the center of this mask it mask is referencing a photograph I took in one of these spaces and a tablecloth that shared the flower um, motif. Um, and this was the first uh, performative uh, textile object that I uh, created. Um, just like the other pieces, you can see the gel medium image transfers. So that's what's creating that sort of faux brocade pattern. Um, and that's being done in this case with um, photocopies of Florida water um, label uh, labels. Um, Florida water, for those of you who don't know, um, can serve many different functions, but is also often used for cleansing um, in the context of ritual or on someone's personal altar, etc. Um, next slide. And in case you're wondering how I come up with these shapes for these performative objects, um, if we think back to the prior slides, um, very much taking after many artists, but specifically thinking about someone like Haridina Pindel, um, I lay down and I trace my body, and then I sort of magnify that form um, multiple times, and that's how I land on the final shape. Um, this was the first mask that I uh, completed during quarantine. Um, so this I completed two weeks ago or last week. This is my most recent mask, mask number five. Um, this was finished a few days ago, um, and I was hoping to share with you guys, since I don't have access to the camera on my laptop, um, you can't see the six masks, but masks that I uh, started sewing a new mask uh, today as well. Um, I also wanted to have a moment to talk about the relationship between the masks and hand paper making. Um, as I started to mention earlier, a lot of the work is personal. It's about this um, connection um, between me and, and my ancestors and, and using that relationship um, to form a future where I can um, create and build my identity. Um, and 
it's hard sometimes for me to understand how I can invite viewers into that world and for it to feel like it's protecting my privacy. Um, and so hand paper making is a process that I um, am so grateful for. And it has acted as a voice in my work many times. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking those masks mask images you just saw, and I'm sort of zooming in on a square, one square inch, two square inch um, segment of that map and magnifying it um, and using that as reference for these handmade paper pulp paintings. So I'm pigmenting um, pulp and abaca. Um, I'm also sourcing natural fibers. I really love working with um, unconventional um, materials for paper making. Um, so I volunteer with Food for Life um, here in Atlanta, and I do their compost runs with Aluma Farm. So I've been collecting the onions, or I collected the onions from one of those runs and created onion pulp. And so I've been using that as well. And you can see here another work um, in progress using different sorts of inclusion. You can see the little bit of mesh. I've been collecting sort of food waste bags um, and string. So other sorts of textures and colors that you see in these other works are arriving and appearing in these pulp paintings as well. I also started making these um, circular sheets because um, I would like to do a huge, 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 as big as I can handle um, sort of pulp painting that's a bit deconstructed, where I treat each of these circular um, handmade paper pieces as an individual sequin um, to create um, a pulp painting as well. Just wanted to show you guys my um, setup. So this is where I do my pulp painting. I created a little vat, um, and you can see my pigments and pulps there on the side. Um, across the way, when I'm not doing pulp painting, when I'm pulling something like the circular sheets, I'm working here. Um, and you can see I'm also doing some natural dyeing. That's what's in the, the black vat there um, in the background. And then lastly, this is my last image. Um, this is what I'm working on today. So I did this this morning. This is the process of how I make these maps. So I cut out um, one of these mesh shapes. And again, I work really intuitively. So I just sort of cut out the shape that, that arrives to me. And then I have this white translucent fabric that I've been working with for all of my maps um, that serves as the background panel. I then sew them together, and then I cut out that um, white bit on the background, that white fabric. That way I'm able to see through the mask, even once it's fully um, embellished, um, because of that um, mesh lining. And you can see in the last image, I have the outline, um, the little stencil that I'll follow um, for my sewing. So that is going to be my first, my first bit of use of the sequins, and then I'll sort of work freely and intuitively um, from there. So that is all I have for you, but I would love to hear questions, thoughts. I know um, our time is, is, is wrapping up with our technical difficulties. So again, I apologize. Thank you for, for hearing me. Kelly, this was wonderful. We do have some questions in the chat that I'll happily facilitate. Um, Absolutely. And the first one is from Jordan Ermakani, who joins us, and she says, thank you so much for this presentation and the space for non-Black persons to think and make commitments to doing anti-racist work. She says, I am so interested in the materiality of these masks and installations. Could you talk about where these materials come from, how you gather them, which I think you, you answered some of that, and the found objects, and if so, from where? And she's thinking so much totally. about Haitian voodoo masks and the glittery surfaces in some of your works, for instance. And then she also asks, um, with regards to these works living, do they live physically in space, or is documentation of them also a part of your work? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Jordan, for your questions and comments. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to do my best to answer them. Thinking about materials and where they come from. Um, I gather a lot of materials. I still have a lot of materials that I gathered the last time I went to the Great Dismal Swamp. And so I utilize those in the performative textile objects. And I'm going to start to utilize them in the pulp paintings as well. Um, I also will be going back to the swamp this week or next. Um, so I hope I will collect more. Um, I do have a lot of sound objects, which I really just sort of happen upon and collect. I definitely, I drive a minivan. I'm for sure that sort of person who sees something on the side of the road and pulls over um, and grabs it, even if I'm not sure <laughs> if it will be helpful. Um, the beads, those sorts of adornments, those are things I'm making by hand. And then I'm um, modifying with different pigments that I'm spraying onto them. Um, things like the um, popcorn or the pearls, I'm just stringing again by hand. That sort of slow, laborious practice is really valuable to me. Um, and I completely agree with you. I, I do think there's a lot of reference to Haitian voodoo and a lot of other um, African religious traditions um, across the diaspora in these masks. 
um, so thank you. I'm glad you see that. I think I'm trying to connect to that and understand where I fit into that um, and really trying to come to terms with the fact that there's so much I don't know about my story, about my ancestors, about my history. Um, and that is why I want to um, bridge that gap um, and have that connection and use these to, to do that. Um, I'm not, did I, let, let me see, is there something else that you mentioned? Oh, you talked about documentation, which, ooh, I was having a conversation with my partner last night because I don't know. This is a great question, Jordan. I, or that's why I don't know, but it's something I'm struggling with as well in terms of the math specifically. So right now I sort of have a little setup in my studio where they sort of hang so that I can easily just sort of grab them and put them on when I want to use them. Um, but when I say apply for an application or show them in a presentation, this question arises for me, is the work the photograph or is the work the mask? Um, and so that is part of the reason why I'm going to the Great Dismal Swamp to really um, do a performance, a private performance, excuse me, do a public performance that I document um, and allow people access into that vulnerable space, um, but not in the context of sort of the, the privacy of my studio where that work actually happens. Um, so I hope that once that work happens, I'll have more clarity around around this, but I'm still trying to to figure that out. So it's a really, it's a really good question. Thank we you. Only have, oh, sorry, Jordan, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say thank you. That, that was really, that was really enlightening. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you, Jordan. Um, we only have just a few minutes left because it's it's getting close to the end, but I have a question um, kind of about the masks. Do you, you know, they have such rich colors and patterns and, and you know, adornments. When you're wearing them, do you feel right. physically, emotionally, kind of spiritually transformed? And when you're putting them on, do, do they physically alter kind of your sense of being? That's an interesting question. I I really think that sort of transformation that you're describing really only happens for me when I'm doing private performance, which I think is such a, like, private performance is such a mysterious term, but it's not that profound in the sense that I really just sort of close the door to my studio, get the lighting how I like it, and sit actively with the work for a, you know, predetermined amount of time. And then I, I journal and reflect on that work and that time and space. And that is, um, well, now that I'm even talking about it, I think that I can see that transformation or the impact of wearing the mask more when I reflect on the experience through writing um, than maybe in real time, if that makes sense, Veronica. That does. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. This you. was uh, beautiful. And, and thank you as well for calling attention to this week's events and, and motivating all of us to gather together to um, confront this, uh, this world that we're faced with. So thank you, Kelly. And uh, thank you everyone thank you for, all joining for joining us. Me. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, and I hope you are able to enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.